In this week's video, I'm trimming the bowl thrown from a highly textured stoneware clay you may have seen me working with in my previous upload. And in this video, I'll show you the trimming of that part, as well as the finishing of a whole range of other bowls, all thrown from different types of stoneware clay. This makeshift arrangement on my workbench is essentially a damp cupboard, and it's how I store pots for a couple of days without them drying out too much. The reason all that plastic was suspended was so it didn't come into contact with any of the pots, as they were just freshly thrown when I placed them underneath it, and if the plastic sheeting touched them, then it might distort them and they wouldn't slowly dry out to leather hard as I want. To neatly wire the pot off, I brace the MDF bat with my knee, and then I glide a taut wire underneath it. In this case, it didn't come away entirely evenly, and you can see that some of that extra clay is left on the base. And so to remove that and level out the bottom, I use a bench scraper to slice away the protruding section. And although this clay is really highly textured, a clean cut like that leaves a lovely smooth surface in a way that my trimming tools won't, as typically they tear through the clay rather than slice through it. As this clay contains many coarse particles, I won't use my normal tungsten carbide trimmers on it, as the hard specks of grog can easily chip the brittle metal they're made out of. So instead I'll be using this range of steel turning tools. They aren't nearly as sharp, but trimming tools don't necessarily have to be, as long as you know how to use them and how to exert pressure with them correctly. If you do work a lot with heavily grogged clays, you'll know just how quickly the metal blades can wear away. So, in a way, it makes sense to use the cheaper steel blades, as they're not going to last anyway, and you don't want to destroy or waste the more expensive tungsten carbide turning tools on clay like this. The rim of this piece has a slight undulation. It's not terrible, but with the wheel spinning it's quite noticeable, but it should be relatively easy to remove the worst of this. I turn the bowl upside down and tap center it, and up close like this you can see that the base is just wavering slightly as it spins. So by holding my hands really steady, I'll attempt to trim away the high point that spins around, in order to make this base as flat and even as it can be. Thrown pots can change shape as they dry, and distortions in the rim like this is probably one of the most common occurrences, but in most cases it's easily fixed. If it's only very subtle and all that's visible is just a soft undulation in the rim, then I usually won't bother doing this step. I then brush some slip onto the wheel head and place the bowl onto it. Once again the pot is then tap centered and the friction caused by this process, in combination with the slip, sticks the pot down very firmly, and it means I can trim the inside and outside without any lumps of clay or mechanical arms getting in the way holding the pot in place. There was still a slight unevenness to the rim, and so I used a kidney, which I held firmly in place, to force the lip into a more circular shape by ever so slightly stretching it out. I also push the rim of the bowl out against the plastic kidney, but at this point, to really refine it, I think I need to trim the rim from the top down. But first, I spent some time cleaning up the interior form, scraping away the more prominent throwing rings, and defining this interior ledge, which was roughly formed at the throwing stage. Although now the clay is leather hard, I'll have an easier time getting it to the exact shape and sharpness I want. In order to trim this detail, I had to make sure there was enough material left in the pot at the throne stage to work with. As if initially I threw it really thin, I simply wouldn't be able to refine the shape like this without risking the destruction of the vessel. So when I'm producing some pots which have particular details like this, I purposefully leave them on the thicker side to then be able to trim them back. Trimming the insides of pots is always a bit of a pain as the turnings accumulate and they can be difficult to remove. But recently I've just been using a soft piece of stoneware clay which I glide over the surface to collect all those smaller specks. This is slowly contaminating my clay, but in theory all the stonewares I'm going to be using in this video fire to roughly the same sorts of temperatures, and they're going to be mixed in such small quantities into my normal clay body before it's all thoroughly wedged together and mixed, which may result in an interesting batch of clay. I've just been trimming the rim, and after turning it to a sharper point, I use the smooth side of a flat rubber kidney to compress the clay and to push in any of those coarse specks of grog, which might otherwise make the rim really sharp. This is followed by some rare dual action kidney use to ensure that this portion of the wall is nice and straight. With the interior form cleaned up, I separate the bowl from the wheel by sliding a sharp metal skim underneath it. And then like always, and like you'll have heard me say hundreds of times by now, I clean the wheel head 
before I place the pot upside down onto it. This way, no tiny chunk of clay sticks itself back into the rim you've just so carefully finished. The bowl is then tap centred so it's spinning directly in the middle of the wheel and then I lock it in place with three pieces of clay. At this stage I usually work from bottom to top, beginning by refining the underside of this ledge on the outside, which I want to more or less be a right angle. It's trimmed using the smallest turning tool I have, and then it's burnished flat and smooth, relatively, anyway, considering the nature of this clay. As these turning tools aren't so sharp, I tend to focus the pressure with them on a particular corner of the blade as opposed to using the whole expanse of it. This means I can typically remove more material at once, but it leaves me with a surface that's covered in grooves, which I then have to trim back over to flatten. Trimming away weight in this section is perhaps the most vital part of turning this pot. Doing so will make this pot feel balanced when held in one's hands, as it was feeling just a tiny bit on the heavy side. I'll be defining the lower section of the pot into two portions. There'll be the sloping wall and the pedestal foot, which will also have a footwell trimmed into it to remove more of the excess weight. I can really feel the clay grinding against my fingertips that are pushing down on the pot. And this is really an instance where I should have used one of my spinner tools to do that job for me. To trim the foot, I begin to remove clay layer by layer, which I find is a slightly safer way of doing it as compared to digging in really aggressively and trying to remove all the clay at once. Doing so is possible, but you need an extraordinary amount of skill to hold the blade steady throughout the movement without it getting caught and dragged around. So I do it bit by bit, especially with a clay I'm unfamiliar with. In terms of how deep to trim, in this case, aesthetically, I want it to match the depth of the wall outside the foot ring but I need to be careful to not trim away too much and I can check as I trim by lightly pressing on the bottom and if I feel like there's any give whatsoever I know it's time to stop digging down. The rest of the trimming is clean up more or less. I want to make the inside wall of this foot nice and straight and finally where the foot is a bit rough I'll once again use the plastic kidney to burnish the clay on this area and it's incredible the difference this makes, even visually you can see it. As this is an object that's going to be placed on a table or a shelf and moved around, I need the foot to be relatively smooth so that it doesn't scratch whatever surface it's placed upon, as people often drag pots as opposed to picking them up and placing them down. Yet this burnished section will change once fired as the stoneware portion of the clay will shrink and recede around the specks of grog, which means what's smooth now won't be once fired. So there's a good chance I'll have to go back over the base with some sandpaper after the pot has been reduction fired to 1290 degrees Celsius. Once stamped with my maker's mark, this bowl is complete, for the time being at least. The next steps are a firing to 1000 degrees Celsius, which causes the pot to become porous so that it can be glazed, and then it's loaded into my gas kiln for another firing to 1290 degrees Celsius. It's an incredibly simple shape, and it does still have a slight undulation to it, despite trying my best to remove it. Yet, you only really notice it when the pot is spinning around, which honestly is something it'll never do again. I can't wait to see how this clay reacts in the kiln and to see how my usual glazes react over it. I've also been testing eight different stoneware clay bodies, which were all really kindly given to me by pot clays. And whilst the rest of this video isn't the deep dive into testing these, like I promised in the future, I'll just be speaking about how these different clays felt to trim. This particular gray body was heavily grogged and textured just like the one you saw me trim at the beginning of this video. This is another clay that's meant to be hand built with, not thrown. It's made in collaboration with a potter, David Wright, and apparently it responds particularly well to being reduction fired. So I absolutely can't wait to see how this looks. It's made from a combination of ball clay and fire clay taken from pot clay's South Staffordshire quarry. It's then mixed with a blend of grog and sand to give it a textured toothy quality. In a way, it's a bit risky making these bowls as glaze tests, as opposed to making simple, small tiles. But I'm hoping they'll fire successfully and that I can include them in my exhibition later this year at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And you can find more information about that in the description of this video.
This brown stoneware was smoother than those previously used, and it was lovely to throw with, as it wasn't so coarse that it ground my hands, but there was certainly enough texture to give it a good amount of strength. The next grey stoneware was very smooth, and it almost felt like plastic to throw with, and more akin to porcelain. The stoneware body I normally use, that's pink in tone, contains a really minimal amount of grog, but it's enough to provide some feedback when tools are held against it, or when those particles of grog rub against your hands. And this makes any clay that's very smooth quite unusual to throw with, as I'm just not used to it. But one quality I always love when working with clays like this is just how thin and refined you can make any sharp edge or lip, as there aren't any larger particles of grog that get in the way. This is the flecked stoneware, and if you look really closely you can see that there are black smudges in the clay, tiny black dots, which in an oxidised atmosphere will give you the impression that the pot has been fired in a reduction atmosphere. Although, as I'll be firing this in a reduction atmosphere, it may become very flecked, but who knows, there's only one way to find out, and hopefully I should get around to firing these pots really soon. The amount of iron these clays contain have a huge impact on how the glazes that coat them will appear. They're the canvases, if you will, and an iron-rich body should make the glazes that are covered over them darker in appearance. This bowl, although similar to the one I trimmed at the beginning of the video, didn't have as much clay left in the base, which means I couldn't trim a tall pedestal foot like the other had, but I couldn't care less, really. This range of bowls are all meant to be different, although there's a few rules that tie them together, such as having quite angular forms sat upon a tapering lower half that concludes with a narrow foot. In some ways, it's a shame they'll lose the tones they have now, as I love their subtle, earthy colours. But let's see, if the raw clay fires nicely, in reduction, I want to make another batch of these which are left raw on the outside, with only their interiors glazed, which I think might work especially well for the grogged clays. The rest of these stonewares are relatively smooth, and are either the premium buff, pot clay stoneware body, Staffordshire stoneware, and what's labelled as the development body, all of which were relatively smooth and easy to throw with. Over the coming months, I will make a more thorough video that explores each of these eight, which I'll do by throwing three small bowls with each clay body, and with each trio, I'll glaze one of each bowl in a different glaze, either the white, the pale green, or the dark green, which is something I've done already in a previous video with only three stonewares. So, this should be a lot more interesting, but accumulating all that footage from every single step can and will take a long time to gather, especially with the launch of my upcoming book on the horizon, which is published in the UK on September 14th and in the USA November 14th. It's still available to pre-order, and I'll leave a link to do so in the description of this video. With the smoother clay bodies, I can switch back to my tungsten carbide turning tools, which makes the process of trimming so much more enjoyable. With the rather dull steel turning tools, it can sometimes feel like you're really pressing the tools into the clay to the point where the shape of the pot might actually change due to that pressure. Whereas with the really sharp tungsten carbide, you're cutting through the clay, and I feel as if I'm able to trim much more refined shapes with these. This is the last bowl of the batch, thrown from a warm, earthy stoneware. It's smooth, but contains a touch of grog, and it actually trims a lot, like the normal stoneware body I use. For the past few years, I've only really used a number of different clays, and I think it's about time I expand on that. Variation in surface, texture, and colour is a good thing, and I'm hoping, now that my body of work has become more recognisable, that it's the shapes that tie all the pots together. I think I've always been drawn to the way of working where numerous different types of clay are used, and your glazes remain more or less the same. This way it's the change of clay that has the biggest effect on the glaze itself, and it means you aren't in a studio that's littered with dozens of buckets of glaze. I suppose it just feels a bit more simple to make these changes through changing clay types, and as long as they're all bodies that more or less fire to the same temperature, I don't mind if they're contaminated and mix from time to time, as these blends might make interesting clays in themselves, and thus creates batches of work which are more one-off and unique, which is definitely something I want to do more of. Thanks so much for watching, and like always, I'll see you next time.